Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third meeting of Session 6 of the Criminal Justice Committee. There are no apologies that have been received today, and the first agenda item is to agree whether to take items 3 and 4 in private, which is consideration of our approach to pre-budget scrutiny and consideration of today's evidence. Are we all agreed? Thank you. So the next agenda item is a roundtable discussion about the impact of COVID on the justice sector and plans for recovery. We will take evidence today from a roundtable of witnesses who will be joining us virtually. I'm sorry you cannot join us in person, but this is due to current rules on social distancing. And I very much welcome our panel of witnesses this morning. We have Mr Tony Lenehan, President of the Scottish Criminal Bar Association of the Faculty of Advocates, Ken Daling, President of the Law Society of Scotland, Assistant Chief Constable Kenny MacDonald of the Criminal Justice Division and Chief Superintendent Barry Blair of Criminal Justice Services Division, both of Police Scotland, Mr Eric McQueen, Chief Executive of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, Chief Officer Martin Blunden and Deputy Chief Officer Ross Haggart of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, Theresa Medhurst, Interim Chief Executive, and Mr Tom Fox, Head of Corporate Affairs of the Scottish Prison Service, Mr James Maybe, Chair of the Justice Standing Committee of Social Work Scotland, and Ms Kate Wallace, the Chief Executive Officer of Victim Support Scotland. And we very much appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. I thank those witnesses who have provided a written submission, and these are now available online. I intend to allow one hour and around 30 minutes for questions and discussions, but we can go on a little longer if needs be, so that everyone can have their say. Can I also just add that we have received an email from the Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum saying that they wished that they had been invited today and also providing us with some additional information on how COVID has affected them. We will arrange to circulate that material uh, to members and I would note that we will have further sessions coming up and so we can see if we can hear from this important body in the future. So can I now ask members to indicate which witness you are directing your remarks to, and then we can open the floor to other witnesses for comments. If witnesses wish to respond, can I ask you to indicate that by typing an R in the chat function on blue jeans, and I will bring you in, if time permits. If you are merely agreeing with what the witness is saying, there is no need to intervene to say so. Other comments you make in the chat function will not be visible to committee members or recorded anywhere. So if you want to make a comment, please do so by requesting to speak. The Blue Jeans platform only shows nine people at any given time, so you may not be able to see yourself on screen. However, the clerks will advise us if anyone actually does lose their connection. So we'll now move directly to questions. Can I ask members and our invited guests to keep their questions and comments as succinct as possible? That said, I'm very keen to uh, encourage a, a free-flowing free discussion. Okay, I will um, kick things off. And um, first of all, I would like to um, ask um, our colleagues from Scottish Fire and Rescue Service just a couple of questions in relation to um, reform uh, within, within the service. Um, but before I do that, I would uh, very much like to put on record my appreciation uh, of the work that Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, have uh, done throughout the pandemic uh, and before that uh, and, and beyond. So um, Mr Blunden and Mr Haggart, uh, I, I very much uh, appreciate um, the work that your service has um, undertaken over the last 18 months or so. So I'd like to start off, really, I think it's quite important to acknowledge the, the kind of well-established role of Scottish Fire and Rescue in 
um, local and regional resilience partnership working uh, in responding to uh, emergencies, albeit I think everybody would agree that um, none of us were quite prepared for um, the COVID uh, pandemic. However, I'm sure that sort of experience uh, came into its own uh, during uh, the period of the, the, the pandemic. Uh, and I noticed that in your written submission uh, and also the Chief Officer's recent report, um, you outlined some of these operational uh, and organisational uh, changes that were put in place, um, for example, um, supporting the Scottish Ambulance Service uh, in some of their work, uh, and also some flexibility that you introduced um, around your sort of tactical response as things developed um, during the period of, of the pandemic. So um, what I'd like to ask about is a, a little bit around reform. Um, so thinking about um, the almost opportunities that COVID presented from a reform perspective, I'm interested to hear how Scottish Fire and Rescue might be able to embed some of those kind of practice changes uh, into your um, into the, the, the organisation uh, going forward. And I think given that yesterday within the programme for government announcement there was some reference, albeit uh, brief, to um, modernising the fire and rescue service. So I'll, I'll hand over hand over to you, uh, Mr. Blunden and Mr. Haggard. Morning, Chair. Morning, Committee. And many thanks for your question and the opportunity to provide evidence this morning. Um, you're right to say that the modernisation of the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service was included within yesterday's announcement on the programme for government, and we welcome that um, inclusion within the programme for government. And we are uh, absolutely committed to um, doing more for the people of Scotland um, as, as a national fire and rescue service. So we really welcome that opportunity. In terms of the, the lessons learned from uh, the COVID pandemic, we have made a, a number of changes to our operating practices and these were very much done to ensure that we could continue to deliver vital services to communities while at the same time keeping our people safe as they were doing so. We, we've got a programme in place, a, a recovery, reset and renew programme that has led to our senior management board uh, and some outline details of the areas that that is looking at is contained within our submission. And we'll absolutely take the opportunity to learn any lessons that we can from the COVID pandemic and the way that we've operated so that we could uh, make enhancements to, to how we continue to protect the communities of Scotland going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, again, just coming back to your written submission, if, if I may, um, within it you set out uh, a, a sort of range of um, what you described as work packages that um, have been developed um, and are being progressed as part of your recovery programme. So they included things like your operational strategy, uh, technology, uh, communications and engagement uh, and prevention uh, and partnership. So I, I was just interested in, within those packages, are there areas of work that you would consider to be priorities, thinking about the opportunity around reform and sort of renewal uh, within Scottish Fire and Rescue um, that you might look to action in sort of quicker time uh, and others may be more uh, longer term uh, pieces of work. Yes, that, thank, thanks for that. Uh, all of those areas are key areas that we're focusing on at the moment through our recovery, reset and renew programme. Um, there are some things that are um, longer term pieces of work within that. And we've also got a, a change portfolio of more significant change projects and programmes ongoing within the service. Things that I would particularly highlight from the work packages that we're developing maybe in, in, in quicker time. Um, in terms of the people area, we've just introduced what we are terming our agile working framework, which is very much providing our staff with much more flexibility regarding 
um, how they undertake their work, particularly support staff um, who have been enabled to, for example, work from home during the, the pandemic. So, so we've got the agile working framework that is now in place to give much more flexibility to our staff, particularly, as I say, support staff and those that don't need to come into the workplace to undertake the role. We, we're also very significantly advanced with a, a new concept for our operations strategy and the way that we have different concepts of operation for different types of activities that we undertake, for example, um, wildfire, um, specialist rescue, um, that operation strategy and the way that we deliver our operations and organise ourselves to deliver those operations, again, is quite an advanced piece of work. And the other thing that I would probably particularly highlight is in terms of prevention, protection and partnerships. You mentioned earlier, Chair, the, the work that we do in conjunction with local and regional resilience partnerships, and that's really important to us to deliver our roles. We have had to make some quite fundamental changes to how we've delivered our prevention and protection work over the pandemic. And again, these are things that we are absolutely learning all the lessons from, so we can ensure that those services we provide going forward uh, are done so effectively and efficiently and using any new technologies and new working practices that we have embraced during the pandemic. Th thanks very much. That that's, that's a, an interesting overview. And um, my final question is really more a, a kind of practical uh, issue or practical question around so people's behaviour and how obviously we were in deep lockdown, very much confined to our homes. And I'm just wondering, uh, particularly around um, the issue of vulnerable people that I know Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, come into contact with uh, on a probably a fairly regular basis. And you've got some very, um, very clear and productive uh, partnership arrangements in how you respond to vulnerable people that you um, that your your staff uh, encounter. I, I just wondered if there was any learning came from um, that period of lockdown and uh, the way in which it impacted on people confined, in particular, confined in their homes, and whether or not there are uh, some learning opportunities. Um, Scottish, for, for Scottish Fire and Rescue in, in that regard, and in particular uh, in informing your sort of prevention work going forward? Yes, thanks, thanks for that. Um, it, it would be true to say that our, our prevention work was impacted by the pandemic, and in order to uh, keep our firefighters and communities safe, we changed our approach uh, to, to prevention work. And we, we still visited the most vulnerable from fire because we felt that the, the risks of not doing that were, the, 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 the were greater than the risks posed by the pandemic. But we obviously took all control measures necessary when we were doing that. We also worked very closely with local partners who are, are very often in touch with the most vulnerable people in society. We uh, engaged at uh, what we termed our Making the Call campaign, which was very much a call to action for um, communities, family members, friends of the most vulnerable to um, look out for their health and well-being during the pandemic. Um, and, and we ha had a, a whole range of media and um, social media advertising campaigns as well, so that we could use a whole suite of um, forums to put safety messages across, which was geared from um, physical visits where we still felt that, that was appropriate with control measures due to the Make the Call campaign, um, working with partners to identify the most vulnerable so that partners could often put across those safety messages and also general safety messages to the public as well. So a whole suite of measures were put in place that we deployed as appropriate, depending upon the risk to individuals and to households, very much working with partners in mind over that period. And again, as you say, Chair, these are all things that we are reviewing and taking forward the best practice into our normal ways of working going forward. 
Thank, thank, thank you very much. That's very sort of inspiring to, to hear that, and, and I'm sure you've got a lot of uh, work ahead in terms of uh, reform and, and, and modernising across a, 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 a very wide range of um, work areas within the service. Th th thank you very much. That's, that's all my questions. Um, I'd now like to move on to um, our uh, Police Scotland representatives. Uh, I know that we have... Um, ACC Kenny MacDonald and Chief Superintendent Barry Blair with us. So, um, welcome. Uh, and again, I would just like to put on record my uh, my grateful thanks um, to your organisation for keeping us safe, for responding to uh, an extraordinary um, period in in our recent times. Uh, very very much appreciated, and I, I know it was not without its challenges uh, for your service. So. What I, I would like to pick up on, if I may, is um, in the written submission from ASPS, um, there was some commentary around some of the challenges um, that you're currently facing uh, relating to recruitment. Uh, now, I, I, I know that this, from my own personal professional background, this is a, a challenge that is not new. Um, I live and work in the northeast of Scotland, and for many years, Grampian Police was um, competing with the oil and gas sector uh, to recruit um, personnel uh, and staff. So this is not a new challenge. But I think there seems to be perhaps some indication that um, we're not entirely clear uh, what is impacting on uh, recruitment. So I'm just interested to hear a little bit about your own thoughts on what those challenges may be uh, and how we can uh, move forward and sort of redress that recruitment balance. Thank you. Have we got ACC? Thank you, Convena, and good morning, members and colleagues. Uh, May I start by thanking you for your very kind words uh, with regard to the service and, and what our officers and staff have uh, undertaken during the period of this pandemic. Turning particularly to your question on recruitment, I, I'm not sure where ASP heard this information. Um, we have 140 new recruits starting this month. We have had a focus on rural and remote recruitment, um, and there's actually 35 new officers going to North East Division. I think what we experienced um, in the early days of COVID was, was a real upsurge in uh, members of the public seeking to join, um, and actually the applications for policing uh, being one of the key public services was something that I think people saw as very attractive as, as they saw avenues to, to help our communities. Um, our level of applications has returned back to a more normal level, um, but there, there are certainly uh, no particular issues with the volume of applications that we have received. Um, given social distancing, however, um, we did uh, reduce the, the intake sizes to make sure that they were safe, uh, introduced lack of flow testing, um, and ensured social distance. But um, recruitment is, is not a particular challenge at this time, and, and it's something that we will pick up with our colleagues in the Association of Police Superintendents for Scotland. Th th thank you very much. Um, that, that's helpful and, and, and reassuring uh, to know. M my next question, uh, I suppose, links to re recruitment, um, and it's more around um, training. Now, I, I, I know that the sort of criticality of some training w within um, within the police service, particularly, for example, around recertification for. Uh, officer safety training, and th th there are other parts of training that can be either adapted or um, or, or deferred. Um, but I'm just interested in a bit of commentary for, from you about the impact um, of the pandemic on th that training sort of regime um, timetable and requirement, 
And I'm thinking particularly in relation to uh, COP26 uh, coming up in the not too distant future and what, if any, challenges uh, you are, are facing um, to make sure that uh, staff, uh, both staff and officers, are uh, ready to go and have um, the requisite training uh, in place ahead of that event. Thank you, convener. Um, I mean, I think in terms of, of training, due to the, the nature of physical distancing restrictions, we faced uh, a lot of essential training, as, as we would consider that, uh, was postponed. Uh, we do have a training backlog. Um, thankfully, uh, with uh, the easing of some of those restrictions, we've managed to reintroduce key uh, training again, particularly in terms of officer safety training, which is, is really important to those operating in, in that frontline response, but also specialist training. And, and we do have a backlog within driver training. Um, but the creation of a strategic training and coordination group under uh, Deputy Chief Constable Fiona Taylor has prioritised the needs of the service to make sure that all of that essential training that we require to undertake in advance of COP26 is prioritised and achieved. And at this time, there is uh, no concerns that we will uh, not meet the training requirements for those specialist officers in armed policing or public order training uh, to achieve our needs for COP26, but it does require significant coordination. It does require innovation. We uh, have introduced uh, MS teams to over 14,000 officers and staff that's allowed uh, a more virtual based training uh, facility to be undertaken, as well as uh, now the reintroduction of some classroom classroom based training, albeit with uh, slightly smaller numbers. So in terms of, of training, yes, absolutely an issue that we are tackling. I'm sure the same as many other agencies, but being prioritised and uh, COP26 is absolutely a matter that is to the forefront of our minds. Th th thank you very much, Mr MacDonald. And just a kind of follow up um, is my final question. Um, for you, again, sticking with, with, with training, is obviously Police Scotland will receive um, significant mutual aid, uh, and, and it's just I'm interested in how the, the, the training um, requirement will be managed, given that you know we we are or COP26 will require um, personnel from a number of different organisations um, uh, uh, that, that we in theory, have no control over their training regime. So it's just uh, how can we be sure that um, the required training uh, will be provided? Uh, so in terms of training, much of the training for specialist assets is under uh, the National Police Chiefs Council and therefore is UK-wide uh, standardised training. Uh, I think what's important in terms of our colleagues who are coming to support us from the rest of the UK is the understanding that we operate within a different criminal justice system, and therefore they will get specific briefings on uh, the law within Scotland. They will also be receiving specific briefings on the policing tone and style that is being set by our Gold Commander, Assistant Chief Constable Bernie Higgins to make sure that the strategic intentions for COP26 and the tone and style, which is a very engaging and facilitative one within Scotland, is what, uh, what we want to achieve. There will be very clear briefings to all officers attending a mutual aid in terms of professional standards, in terms of Scots law and in terms of proportionality, in terms of approach that, that we will be looking to achieve in the delivery of which is one of the largest scale policing events uh, that the UK has experienced. So those those briefings are in place uh, and will be delivered in the coming weeks. 
Th thank, thank you very much, Mr MacDonald. That, that, that's all from me, and that um, brings my questions to a close for the moment. Um, I'll now hand over to um, Mr Finlay, and then I'll bring in Ms Stevenson after that. OK, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd quite like to ask Mr Blandon or Mr Haggart a question. Obviously, you're dealing with a, a huge volume of, or a, a return to normal almost of, of fires, but we have also seen in recent weeks a spike or a number of high-profile willful fire raisings, which we believe are linked to organised crime. Can you quantify that in any way? And have you had any discussions specific to that, either internally or with the police or other agencies? Uh, thanks very much for your question, Mr Finlay. In terms of our um, incident activity, there are some figures provided within our submission, and I'm more than happy to provide any additional detail um, on any specific incident types that we are attending numbers um, to the committee off, off table. But there are some overarching figures provided there in terms of comparing last year to quarter one of this year, and indeed a return to um, what we would consider to be more normal um, levels of operational activity. In terms of specific willful fire raising, um, we have got a number of um, preventative initiatives that we have ongoing with partners locally. In terms of willful fire raising, we also work very, very closely with uh, Police Scotland colleagues to investigate uh, incidences of willful fire raising. We have got uh, specialist fire investigation staff that work with Police Scotland and uh, Scottish Police Authority forensic colleagues to report um, matters of willful fire raising into the, the relevant procurator fiscal, and, and we work with those colleagues on an ongoing basis. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to ask questions of uh, Police Scotland. I don't know whether it would be CC Macdonald or, or Chief Superintendent Blair. Um, the issue of unanswered 101 calls. We know from the Scottish Police Authority meeting that in June 71,000 calls were abandoned, which represents around 40 per cent of all 101 calls in that month. Um, given what was uh, admitted to yesterday in relation to the M9 tragedy, which was historic, um, it does seem that this problem of unanswered calls or calls not acted upon has not been addressed and perhaps worsened during the COVID pandemic. Is that the case? Why have we still not got a grip of it? And what needs to happen in order to fix this problem and give public confidence that calls will be answered? Thank you, Mr McGregor. Um, I think, firstly, as the Chief Constable said yesterday, um, we would want to offer our condolences to both families. Um, I think the, the issue of 101 calls in 2015 and where we are now is significantly different. Uh, looking at COVID in particular, that has presented challenges to our contact command and control division in terms of social distancing and in terms of absence, as, as you would see in many, many other agencies. What I would highlight is that our emergency response answering, the, those who dial 999, we have maintained that emergency response to an exceptionally high level throughout the pandemic and made sure that anyone who phones for the police in emergency that they are answered and responded to appropriately. For non-emergency calls, um, that has taken longer. Part of our, our COVID response, consider whether the individual calling for service um, has COVID, has been in contact with somebody with COVID, and that's part of our required uh, health and safety considerations before dispatching officers or staff to that location. Uh, we've also introduced the contact assessment model, uh, where we thrive 
uh, all calls that come into the service, so we consider threat, risk, harm, vulnerability to make sure that the most appropriate response can be provided to uh, that particular incident. So whilst there, there have been challenges, and, and those have been clearly articulated at the Scottish Police Authority, and the Chief Constable has spoken there publicly around that matter, um, we continue uh, to improve our service. We have an ambitious programme of change that we are continuing to work through regarding modernised contact and engagement. So I think that the public can be reassured that in an emergency that, that the police still answer. We are that emergency service that continue to answer all calls in a very effective time, um, and we continue to respond uh, appropriately. Thank you. Um, just back on that, is there not a risk, though, if you put a reliance on emergency calls being answered, rightly so, that people might give up on 101 and it becomes a bit of a pointless option and, and they'll turn to 999 calls? I think 101, and we've put out public communications regarding uh, the use of 101, we, we see that uh, some of the, the 101 calls that we receive are seeking advice and guidance and uh, we are directing people to other online opportunities to, uh, to get that information. Um, looking specifically at COVID, sometimes we were receiving calls um, seeking guidance on uh, what the, the legislation or Scottish Government public health guidelines meant, and these were available, as, as you will be well aware, uh, in other online forums. Uh, we also have increased our use of um, online reporting, um, which is another means through which uh, members of the public can, can contact the service. And indeed, in this modern age, many people actually prefer that as, as a medium of contact. So I think that, that there is still a strong need for a one-on-one -on -one service and for, for it to, to perform at a high level. But the, the call answering times are, are improving, and, and we have plans uh, to improve that further. So I think the public should still maintain a confidence in, in that service. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just move on quickly to Mr. Lenehan, if he's there. I can't quite make it out on the screen. Um, in, in your submission, you talk about the problem of a suspicion that some witnesses and accused people are avoiding turning up in court due to fake text messages purporting to be from presumably medical or official sources. Can you expand on that in any way and um, perhaps tell us what can be done about it, if anything? The direct experience I had most recently involved somebody from south of the border who presented on the face of it convincing text messages at three trial diets in a row, but was not prepared to have face-to-face -face testing done. And the eventual conclusion of the Crown was that this was a ruse of some sort. The practical difficulty is that, it, well, in that case, first of all, what was communicated to me was that Police Scotland, when sent to inquire, uh, were not able to obtain information from English hospitals who simply wouldn't engage with them. There have been any number of cases where witnesses, for example, complain of COVID-like symptoms, and if that's in the midst of a trial, it's very hard to accommodate the necessary periods of self-isolation within that existing trial. So very often it has a consequence for, because we've got a jury sitting, we can't have a jury who idle for 10 days or so. But I think it's viewed by some as an easy way out, because if they make the claim of COVID, it's very hard for us as legal professionals and for Scottish courts and tribunal service to dig down to the bottom of that claim 
and it very often means that, that just from a practical point of view, a trial has to be abandoned. So, I'm, I'm not aware at the moment of any prosecutions, for example, of people falsely claiming it, but the experience of my members and my own experience satisfies me that it is used by people as a means of avoiding something they don't want to happen. And it might be that that applies in other aspects as well of uh, life in Scotland, not just in the courts. But it's an issue here. Now you ask me, how could I fix that? I don't know the answer to that. I think that others might be able to determine how you could have a, a, a robustly verifiable system where it's not sufficient for you to be sent something and then get your pal who has COVID to take the test. I, I don't know how people do it. But uh, I think that is an issue because it had a consequence for trials. There was a trial in Glasgow High Court last week in which I had a peripheral involvement which eventually collapsed because, again, of perhaps disputed COVID symptoms on the part of one person and uh, they just became impossible to continue with a jury sitting out in the remote centre as from day to day there was just a lot of uncertainty about it. So it might be that in, in the grand scheme of the difficulties that Scotland faces just now, this is not a big deal. But uh, I thought I would bring it to your attention since I was asked to consider the negatives and the positives that, that, that have, have arisen in the current situation. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, now, I'm conscious of time and I would like to ask questions of everybody, but can't do that. So finally, uh, just to uh, Mr Darling at the Law Society. Um, the thorny issue of, of legal regulation is, has been with us for many, many years. Uh, COVID appears to have put on ice the recommendations of Esther Robertson that a new single clear uh, body should be established in order to uh, deal with legal regulation. Now, without having to, most of you won't have read her review, but page eight is worth a look. That's the current uh, regulatory framework, which you know serves no purpose to members of the public. Uh, I'm just wondering, from the Law Society's perspective, whether COVID is going to, given all these other massive challenges, going to get in the way of this long overdue uh, reform to the regulatory system? Good morning, Mr. Finlay, uh, members, convener, and thank you for having this opportunity to engage with you. Can I offer on an ongoing basis the Law Society uh, as a constructive partner in moving forward uh, the agenda of this committee? Um, without wishing in immediately to disagree with you, uh, it is not clear to me that the current regulatory system does not properly serve uh, the people of Scotland. And in fact, the representations which the Law Society have made uh, in relation to the Robertson Review after the effect that largely it was a review, the main conclusion of which had perhaps been formed in the mind of Ms Robertson before the investigation process had begun. And you will note that there is dissenting opinion within certain members of the review team. Can I say also that the review that was commissioned by the government from Ms Robertson was done on the basis of identified failings in the regulatory process which was brought to the attention of the government by the Law Society itself. The Law Society wants to be an effective and proportionate regulator of the profession. The Law Society's position as a representative of the profession is enhanced by a robust regulatory model. And a careful examination of the review report finds it difficult, in my respectful opinion, to identify any particular failings beyond largely the systemic and procedural uh, problems which were initially identified by the Law Society and which the Law Society would be keen to have addressed. Uh, COVID has meant that various things have had to be prioritised, uh, various things therefore shelved. Um, I understand that the consultation uh, that was to be proposed uh, in relation to the Robertson recommendations is now in prospect for publication and for action. The Law Society welcomes that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stevenson, and then I'll bring in Mr. Green. Okay, thanks, convener, and um, 
Good morning to each and every one of you. And first of all, can I just say thank you to each of the public agencies uh, for all the work that you've done and all the staff um, who have absolutely stepped up to the mark in what is unprecedented times. It's absolutely commendable to see um, the sort of range of work that you have done to basically keep our community safe here in Scotland. So my line of questioning is going to be focused on the prison service. So um, I'm going to ask Teresa and Tom um, about like a purposeful activity and rehabilitation programmes. It's outlined in your submissions about how that was suspended during COVID. And really just to find out if you could outline what plans are to roll out um, you know, the key areas in terms of purposeful activity. Um, has there any lessons been learned in how we go forward? Um, is there anything you know that you've got as well in terms of transformational you know, ideas about how, how we can do things differently as well to ensure that you know, key to that is that you know the prison um, service are delivering, you know, within the human rights, um, purposeful activity and education, and also delivering the programmes for rehabilitation as well. Good morning, uh, Ms. Stevenson and uh, committee and the, the convener, um, as well as colleagues. Uh, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, and thank you for your question around um, purposeful activity in particular. Uh, we, at the start of the pandemic, um, the prison service, I'm sure you'll understand, um, recognised the particular vulnerabilities in our prisons and therefore had to take quite um, considerable action and made um, significant change to our operating arrangements in order to comply with um, Scottish Government guidance um, and changes to legislation, as well as ensuring that we were keeping everyone in our care safe. And that includes our staff and our partner agencies as well. Um, over the, the full um, period uh, of the pandemic, we have um, developed a route map uh, which reflected Scottish Government guidelines in order to ensure that there was legitimacy around the action that we were taking. And that um, meant that we received um, very commendable cooperation from those in our care who have been subjected to quite significant restrictions during this time, as I'm sure you'll understand. We all experience that in communities. It, it has been, I suppose, even more restricted for those in our, our prisons. Um, as a consequence of that, um, at the very start of uh, the pandemic and the very start of lockdown, we had to change the shape of our operating day. Um, and that was partly due to um, the staff profile at that time and partly due to our ability to focus on uh, those things that would be important. So um, access to, to fresh air, um, access to um, means to contact family, access to showers, meals, etc. Um, and because we had to reflect um, the Scottish Government guidance, we focused and concentrated on those activities for people where um, we had to provide a service. So that was the, the laundry service, industrial cleaning, um, and our catering services, as well as ensuring that we still had supplies um, coming into our prisons. Um, we have applied the guidance in relation to social distancing. That has meant um, cohorting our population into smaller households, and that has meant it has demanded greater staff time. But what that has also resulted in is closer working relationships. So whilst the relationships in prisons have always been positive, and I think if you look at the inspection reports, um, that's reflected across the board um, in our prisons. But during the pandemic, those relationships have actually become closer and the communication and engagement has been really positive. Um, so we, we did have to um, put down the majority of our activity, including the um, uh, our learning service from Fife College, our prisoner programmes, 
Um, and it was only when we started stepping out of lockdown with the rest of the country that we were able to look at the arrangements that we could put in place in order to reinstate some of those services. I'm sure you will understand that that has limitations because of the restrictions. So, whilst we reinstated prisoner programmes in September of last year, um, we are restricted in terms of the size of the room, the number of people who can um, be located in that room, um, in order to be able to ensure that people are kept safe. Um, the same with other activities. So we have we have basically stepped through as government has stepped through their um, route map, our route map, in order to ensure that activity has been reinstated as and when it has been safe to do so. But during all of this time, I would have to say that um, our colleagues in um, Fife College, our psychology teams. Um, and the, the, our NHS colleagues have provided a lot of materials and support for those in our care to ensure that they had um, uh, access to uh, learning packs, materials for, for meditation and um, self-help, um, in-cell um, gymnasium activity, if you like, so helping people to understand how they could keep themselves well whilst there were limitations and restrictions on their activities. In terms of, of and, and we are still working through um, that that reinstatement, um, with the next phase being reinstating the longer day, um, and establishments are working incredibly hard at the moment to ensure that we've got um, sufficient programmes of work for people um, across a, a longer day. And that we have the staff profile to be able to support that, not just ourselves, but for our, our partner organisations as well. And we aim to have that um, in place over the next few weeks. The other thing that um, I should uh, um, make reference to is, um, in terms of, of lessons learned, what's been interesting is that the, um, those smaller cohorts of um, our population. Um, have actually presented people with um, a feeling of greater safety, um, and that's been reported back um, consistently throughout that time period. So certainly, when we are looking to reinstate activities, whilst we need to be mindful of the the public health guidance, we are also factoring in how people have um, fed back to us. They have felt during that period. In terms of feeling um, safer in those in those smaller cohorts, with regards to transformational ideas, um, I think a couple of areas. So there has been the opportunity, um, and that was accelerated last year um, through considerable agility um, of of our teams to put in place um, more access for. Um, uh, families of those who are in, in prison to um, have contact because we had to step visits down um, at the at the initial um, start of the pandemic and the lockdown period. So we have introduced a variety of means. So we have um, a voicemail service now, which was introduced um, where families can leave voice messages on the phone system. We also introduced virtual visits and that not only has that enabled um, families to make contact directly into the prison, but it has also enabled those in prison to see family members in their home. That has had, I suppose, um, some positives and negatives. Some people have found that really difficult um, to deal with, but others have found it positive. For example, being able to see their children on the first day of school in their school uniforms, which would not have um, been possible previously. So it has opened New opportunities and the, the opportunity for people to be family out with Scotland um, and certainly um, in other in other countries. And then the final one would be um, the introduction of mobile phones, um, which has given again another means of contact, um, not just for people with their families, um, but the the um, there are other numbers that they they are able to to call for support as well. So. All of that um, has enabled us to uh, fully appreciate and realise the opportunities that can be achieved through technology. 
um, and certainly it would be our intention and we are exploring how we can make better use of that technology to support more um, learning and self-help opportunities, particularly in relation to health. And I know that our health um, colleagues, our NHS colleague, colleagues, have found the benefits of using more virtual technology um, has significantly supported their ability to continue to deliver services during this difficult time. Can, can, I, can I just come in, Ms Medhurst? This is um, ex extremely important and very interesting. Just in the spirit of um, timekeeping, I wonder if we can um, just keep our um, answers um, as, as concise a as possible. Thank you. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, I just quickly, um, obviously, in light of the fact that we're, you know, time restricted as well, is is really just you touched upon staff shortages and the impact that that's had. Has that pro improved at all? The position with staff shortages, as I'm sure you'll understand, um, is not a, a constant um, because we have had outbreaks um, in prisons over the course of the full pandemic. Um, at the moment, um, our uh, absence levels related to COVID are sitting around um, 3%, um, which is, is not not necessarily insignificant, but it's it's certainly not giving us any cause for concern. But where there are um, outbreaks in particular sites and there are wider implications, then we can and have employed staff from other um, establishments to be able to support them, um, and we can continue to do so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'll now bring in Mr. Green, and then followed by Ms. McNeil. Thank you. Thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning to the panel. Uh, I've got three separate questions and lines of questions, and I'll, I'll just throw it out, and, and I would ask that we try and keep our responses as condensed as possible so we can get through the three topics. The first is on the temporary COVID measures, uh, which were introduced by government, which, of course, we all appreciate and understand were a reaction uh, uh, to the circumstance that, that we were in, and we know how unprecedented that was, to use that overused phrase. But I do wonder, uh, having read the submissions specifically from the Faculty of Advocates and the Law Society of Scotland, you seem uh, to raise specific uh, issues around modifications which you believe should end when the public health emergency ends, specifically in relation to virtual hearings and the so-called use of uh, virtual or, or digital uh, justice. Uh, and to quote uh, the Faculty of Advocates, uh, digital justice is only justified if we continue to prioritise justice ahead of convenience. Uh, and you go on to say that uh, the boldness of the plan to double High Court trial frequency will expose further the depleted defence resources. So I just wondered if I could uh, give you the opportunity to comment on what concerns you have about some of the temporary measures that you think may end up permanent and what you would call on the government to uh, cease as soon as, as is practically possible. And in return, perhaps the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service may wish to respond to any criticisms or concerns that are raised. Shall I direct that first to Mr Lenehan and then Mr Dolling? Hi. Uh, yeah. First of all, I have to doff my bonnet to the this SCTS delivery team for putting in place the electronic system. I'm not sure if you, any of you have had the chance to look at it, but the fact that such a complicated system works so well is extraordinary. But the reality is that the words that are set down in our submissions are heartfelt. Nothing is improved in terms of communication by using screens the way we're using screens today. There's no doubt that each of us would respond better to the nuances of other people's interventions and arguments if we could all be in the same room and speak to each other and see each other. Uh, it really does come down to the fact that whilst there are conveniences built into the virtual scheme, there's no improvement in communication. There's a measurable um, reduction in the ability to communicate. And decision makers, whether they be juries or judges or sheriffs or 
whatever. They need the best information in order to take the best decisions. And so if those that have the information, whether they be witnesses, whether they be lawyers, whether they be accused people, their ability to communicate is diminished, then the eventual decisions are reduced. I also make the other point. If you come to the High Court, the High Court is a grand um, structure which strikes fear into the heart of those who are here to do evil. When we reduce it to TV screens, I mean, I see myself, and I'm not the size of a postage stamp on this, you lose the sense of awe-inspiring grandeur, which either melts the resolve of the guilty to take a matter to trial, or stiffens the resolve of those who are, we are scared to tell the truth. We lose all of that. We've got a situation now where if you're in custody for an, for an offence, the preliminary hearings in the High Court, which are substantial hearings, they're hearings where you argue about excluding evidence, admitting evidence, um, whether things are fair or not. The, the default position is that takes place not even just with a virtual link, but with no link at all to the, the prisoner. This prisoner is just not simply present. I, I, and so everything that has happened has reduced the ability of the accused person and the user of the High Court, whether that be a witness, whether that be a complainer or a family or whatever, to have the full value of their involvement in it. And so the, the sooner we step back from this, the better from the point of view of justice. And really, my argument is based on the fact that in the High Court, it has to be about justice first and foremost. And all of the matters of convenience in shepherding people to court, and keeping uh, people from travelling on the roads and all of that sort of thing, I understand that there are benefits there, but those benefits do not measure up to the benefits of having the most accurate and fair justice. And virtual contact reduces all of that. Thank you for that. Um, so the sooner... That's me. Thank you very much. No, no, I, I think you've made your point eloquently, um, and uh, the, the, your submission speaks for itself. Uh, Mr. Dolling, do you have any comment? Uh, I know, for example, you uh, say that now is not the time to fundamentally change the Scottish criminal justice system without robust consultation and research. You, are, are you aligned with the Faculty of Advocates' view on these temporary measures and their permanency? I am indeed, Mr. Green. Good morning. Uh, and uh, although the convener told us not simply to agree with somebody else, I do agree entirely with what Tony's had to tell you today. I'm conscious that in your discussion with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice a week ago, Ms. Clark indicated that, in her view, there were very good reasons for doing things the way we used to do them. And some of those systems perhaps didn't take account of the technology that we have, the remote empanelling of jurors. That's a no-brainer. Why have we not been doing that for years? That certainly should stay the electronic submission of documents just exactly the same. But I noted in the submissions by the Scottish Police Federation comment that absolute fairness should not be compromised for convenience. And I think it goes beyond that. Uh, Mr Green, you said last week you spoke about best evidence in court, and Tony has highlighted how the arena of the criminal court in particular it has a very specific and a very beneficial effect on those who find themselves within that arena. Now, I do accept that there's a need to allow witnesses to give evidence in a supported fashion and to allow them to give evidence in a way which they feel comfortable with. But there is a real risk if we go too far in relation to these measures that the weight of a witness's evidence will be diluted because, as Tony points out, there needs to be that contact between the decision maker and the person whose evidence they have to weigh. So, uh, yes, uh, there are concerns about maintaining measures uh, for too long. There are certainly benefits that have been learned over the course of the pandemic. There is a fear, perhaps, that changes could be Trojan horsed in, if I can use that term, on the back of uh, the COVID pandemic. I'm entirely aligned with the Lord President when he says that just because it's the way we used to do things doesn't mean it's the way we've got to continue to do them. But we have to value those things which are of value within our system and get back to those to make sure that the absolute fairness of the system is again guaranteed. Mm -hmm. It's probably only right and fair, convener, that the <laughs> Mr McQueen has offered the opportunity to respond. And I think I asked that in the context of um, there clearly are concerns that whilst there is a drive to address the backlog, that's something that 
that there is a, a lot of um, uh, uh, concern about that we don't do that in a way which dilutes the, the, the sanctity, if you like, of putting justice ahead of uh, convenience. Absolutely. And can, can I say, first of all, I don't disagree with some of the things that either that Tony or Ken were saying. Um, and, and I don't take it as criticism either. I mean, this is a, a debate about what justice is going to look like at a part of time in the future. And absolutely, we shouldn't be doing anything simply for convenience. Um, this has got to be about best evidence and it's got to be about protecting the right to a fair trial. And, and no one would disagree with that at all. Um, I think some of the areas you know, that we that we have brought in in recent years, I think to a certain extent, demonstrate that. So for a long number of years now, we have taken evidence remotely from vulnerable witnesses in a whole range of cases, which has worked very well and something we want to loot to extend. Um, we have brought in evidence by commission where we have now a, a full pre-recording and cross-examination recorded live and brought back into court at the moment for children, but looking to extend that further to adults. So there's already developments that are underway in terms of extending digital access to courts that have been very beneficial and I think widely recognised. I think it would be unfair just to categorise everything as being a, a, a step backwards. There are some really positive examples of where we are starting to see the benefits. I think in relation to queues being in court, I think there is a, a growing sense that actually moving back to have a queues, particularly in preliminary hearings on first diets and so on business when the pandemic allows us to, would be a sensible way to go. Um, but equally, I think actually having a, a hybrid type option where we can allow different people to join hearings in different ways, I think equally is beneficial, whether that's for the defence or for the prosecution. But particularly looking to extend that to police and expert witnesses. Uh, we have some 20,000 policemen a year giving evidence to courts across the country. Is there a model we could introduce that would actually allow police to give evidence? We've piloted that now in about six high court trials. And so far, it has been fairly successful. So, I think rather than just putting up barriers to everything, I think we need to we need to test. We need to look at where the benefits are. We need to look at where the opportunities are, and try and determine what's going to be best for the for, for the system going forward. But there are obviously a range of issues. I mean, the electronic submission of documents and electronic signatures, I think, has been regarded as a success across the whole system, and that was certainly something we would. We, we would like to keep it in place and, and, and look to expand in the future. Um, we are piloting digital summary trials, fully virtual summary trials in Aberdeen for domestic abuse cases. And again, there will be an evaluation carried out, and that's so we can have proper and full discussion about the merits, about the benefits, and where these things have a place. So it's not a case at all of the courts trying to force this through as some sort of a, a, a Trojan horse as this time but trying to have very open discussion about how we can improve the justice system where we take advantages of digital technology, but absolutely making sure we protect access to justice and rights to a fair trial. Um, you know, one area which was explored during the, the COVID period was dealing with custody cases um, by virtual means. Um, we now see that as being an opportunity to move to a model where the vast majority of custodies are dealt with virtually. So rather than moving people around in vans on a, a daily basis and having them sit in court buildings for eight or ten hours a day waiting on a hearing, um, could we do that in a fully virtual environment while fully taking account of people's vulnerabilities and where they may have issues that wouldn't allow them to, to take part in that? So I think we've got to just be open to the opportunities that exist, but at the same time be wary about where there may be concerns about where it does actually impact on the quality of justice, but certainly doing it for convenience. Um, it, it is not something we would support at all. Th th thank you for that uh, feedback. Although I would refer you to the previous comments made about virtual hearings and that lack of communication and the importance of actually appearing in the High Court itself and the gravity of doing so, that, that I think that all, of, all of that must be taken into account. On a completely separate issue, and I think that discussion around changes to the justice system will, will rumble on, but can I ask uh, Police Scotland to respond to the submission, if you've read it from the... Mr. Green, oh, can, I, can I maybe just bring in a supplementary, just in while we're... Just, yes, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I actually, just in, in relation to sort of remote justice and the issues and challenges there, I'm quite keen to bring in Miss Wallace from Victim Support Scotland. 
um, and just give you a, a, an opportunity to maybe say a few words um, from your organisation's perspective, just around the kind of rights of uh, victims um, in the um, in the context of remote justice, uh, and also perhaps um, the issues and challenges around court delays. Ms. Wallace. Thank you, convener, um, and thanks, members and other colleagues. Um, yeah, I just wanted to come in on that issue around um, the discussion around remote um, trials and, and potentially hybrid models. It, Tony Lenahan described themselves in, himself the intimidating environment that a court can be, and I think it's worthwhile remembering that many victim support organisations across the board hear victims um, and witnesses describing exactly how traumatising that environment is, and often will describe the court process as being more traumatising than the actual crime itself. So I think we need to remember that in the context of the provisions that already existed, as Mr McQueen laid out, for vulnerable witnesses in particular to be able to give evidence remotely, and my own organisation and others would be asking for an extension of that. Um, because we have seen some really good work coming out of the COVID pandemic around that. There have been some really good opportunities. We have supported um, victims to give evidence remotely and have been continuing to do that. And Many of them are describing how much how better their evidence is, is um, because of being able to provide that um, remotely. Now, obviously, it is not a convenient model, actually. It does require a lot more resource and a lot more planning. Um, but if witnesses and victims' um, mental health and making sure that a justice system in Scotland is not in and of itself traumatising is important to us, then I think we need to hold on to that. So when we are talking about a hybrid model, I would just like to say that we need to remember about victims and witnesses within that, um, rather than just going down a route of potentially professional witnesses, um, police witnesses, for example, giving evidence remotely. We would like to see that extended to other witnesses and perhaps not just vulnerable ones um, too. So yeah, that was that was what I wanted to say on that issue. And in terms of your question around um, convener the impact of the pandemic um, on victims and third sector organisations, I mean we have seen a significant impact on people's mental health. Um, as you know, I have discussed that elsewhere in other roundtables. Um, our own organisation saw a 400 per cent increase at the start of the pandemic on people who were reporting suicidal um, ideation. And the delay in trials is having a massive impact on victims and witnesses' mental health. I was just checking the figures there. Normally, we would see the numbers of figures that we would see about safeguarding incidents that include suicidal um, ideation in a week. We're, um, we're now in a month. We are now seeing every single week um, as standard. So in July 2019, we had five incidents of people who were reporting um, suicidal thoughts. In July 2021, that was up to 20, and that's um, on the conservative side. In August, it was much much higher than that again. So there has been a massive impact on on um, victims and witnesses, and there has also therefore been an impact on um, support services. So the normal NHS routes have often not been available. So a lot of third sector organisations have seen themselves having to provide longer term support and more um, more enhanced support um, for people who have been really struggling um, during that period, and also trying to do that in a safe environment. Um, so many providing support over the phone um, rather than face to face, and that in itself has been um, a challenge. And, and the, the delays to trials, as you know, have had a massive impact on us in terms of capacity across the whole of the third sector, because we're supporting people for a longer period, um, because trials are, are, are so much delayed. Um, that's having an impact, and as I say, the depth of support that people are needing is, is a lot more. Um, and, and the big kind of I suppose takeaway really from me is about involving third sector as equal partners in any planning process that we have, um, and making sure that we're involved early enough um, so that we can be prepared um, and gear ourselves up for for support and um, whatever models um, we're going to take forward. I hope that answers your question. Thank, thank you very much, Ms. Wallace. That was that was helpful. Um, hand back to Mr. Green. Have you got some? Yes, thank questions. you. And that was a very helpful intervention, and thank you, Miss Wallace. And I do commend the work of Victim Support Scotland. We've all dealt with casework where you've been an integral part of supporting constituents, uh, and I know it's been an incredibly difficult time. Those statistics are very worrying uh, about interventions that you've had to deal with, um, and I'm sure uh, we'll maybe hear from Mr. Maybe around 
some of that as well, as hopefully today. But um, I have an entirely separate question. Uh, we had a submission in our papers to today's session from the Scottish Police Federation. Um, I'm not going to comment on its content, uh, agree nor disagree, but I would like to give Police Scotland the opportunity to respond. It contains quite, I'd say, relatively harsh critique of Police Scotland therein, uh, uh, using a phrase uh, that the internal bureaucracy and turgid decision-making meant that Police Scotland was on the back foot during the pandemic. It said that command and control st structure was found to have little or no control. And it finally says that throughout the pandemic, it feels that police officers felt neglected and unsupported by government and that abandonment should not be underestimated. Do you have any response to those concerns? Uh, thank you, Mr. Green. Um, I don't recognise and would strongly disagree with much of the content of that submission. Um, what I do agree with within that submission is that our officers and our staff have really stepped up during this pandemic. They've done so in a balanced and proportionate manner and maintained public trust and confidence. What I also agree with is the issue of the volume of citations that will come with the expansion of the court, uh, court numbers, um, which are taking place at the moment. And we are working closely with our colleagues in Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service and COPFS to minimise the impact on the withdrawal of officers for court purposes from their communities. But I would also um, highlight uh, within that submission, which I think is important, is the number of increasing number of people who are now on bail. It goes back to Ms Wallace's point about the length of time that uh, cases are coming to fruition. So, therefore, we have individuals who are on bail and continue to be within our communities uh, for that longer period. So, I think those are issues which I, I would concur with. The rest of it, um, I, I certainly do not. I think we've maybe lost um, Mr. Macdonald momentarily. Can you still hear us, Mr. Macdonald? I can. Did, did you were you able to hear my comments? Yeah, we did. Oh, sorry. Oh. We, we did. Thank you. And and I think your your feedback is noted. Uh, there's no need for further commentary. I have a question on prisons, but I think it might be better served as a supplementary to allow other members to come in. Fa thank you very much, Mr. Green. And um, just I'm conscious of time. And um, we're, we're having a very comprehensive uh, session, so um, if uh, members are, and witnesses are, are agreeable, we'll uh, look to extend the, the, the session just in order to let everybody uh, speak um, till around about midday. I hope that's not going to be inconvenient for witnesses in particular. It's just so that everybody can get a, a reasonable um, time uh, allocation. And again, I would just... Um, uh, remind um, members and, and witnesses, if possible, to keep your questions and answers as succinct uh, as possible. So um, we'll move on to Ms McNeill now, and then followed by Ms Mackay. Ms McNeill. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, and I just want to put on record, as my colleagues have, a um, commendation to all the services and organisations. So it's been incredible hard work to get through the crisis. Um, I want to begin uh, with the Faculty of Advocates submission. Um, I find it really helpful in set, uh, the way that it was set out in identifying um, what uh, practitioners thought was helpful to keep and what was not helpful to keep, because it's going to be a, an essential issue, I think, for the committee in examining um, how we go forward. Um, so my first question is to Tony Lenehan. And in the paragraph about the backlog of trials, um, I identified to talk quite a lot about the role of the defence and the depletion of talent and how this might impact uh, and what seems to be a good progress on trying to deal with the backlog of trials. And I wondered if you'd like to expand on that. Um, thank you very much. To a certain extent, I tread on the toes of Ken Darling because a lot of that is to do with solicitors as they make their way up through the ranks and uh, both play their part in high court trials 
but also come to the bar in due course. So it, it might very well be that Ken is better placed, but it, it's something that I've observed. I, I was in private practice for many years, but left private practice, I think, 17 years ago. So I, I don't have anything recent enough to be of particular benefit to you, except what I observe from my current standpoint. Um, and there is no question to my mind that there is such a low ebb of spirit, such a low ebb in terms of the motivation to come into the career of criminal defence, uh, that, that it's definitely having an impact. People speak to me about the difficulty they have retaining staff. You know, that there is a, a lot of positives flow from the recent extra investment in the uh, Procurator Fiscal Service and Crown Office, but that has an impact in that people who have uh, criminal defence firms can't now retain staff because they can't make a financial case for matching the offers that the Crown can make. So it's, it's going to come home to roost in that if we're going to approximately double the capacity, the throughput of the High Court, it's going to place stresses on a system which has been weakened year on year for certainly the last decade. And uh, the, the, it will expose the cracks in it, I have no doubt. There isn't a quick fix to that, but as I say, I, I really don't want to step, step on Ken's toes any more than I did in my submissions. But uh, we notice it at our side. It has an impact on us because our membership is drawn almost entirely from experienced criminal solicitors, and uh, we notice the things that we set out in the submissions, and they are not positive. Thank you. Um, in that case, um, could I put that question to Ken Dowling? Um, about the role of the defence and the depletion of talent? Thank you very much, yes. Um, the private practice business model has delivered for the people of Scotland and it's delivered for the government since ever I've been a solicitor. It has provided the most efficient way to deliver defence in a legal aid environment, but it is underfunded and it has been now for more than a generation. It was on the back of that that the immediately preceding Cabinet Secretary for Justice agreed uh, a support package, which included, yes, an increase in fees this year and next year, albeit a, a modest one, and included further uh, a resilience package to actually help the solicitors who were unable to get through the work because simply the courts weren't operating uh, over the initial period of the lockdown. Uh, those supports have been appreciated. But my concern is that it may well be too little too late. And as we said in response to uh, the uh, offer of support from uh, the Cabinet Secretary, it was only a start. Uh, at the moment, uh, solicitors in private practice have a core payment rate of £45 an hour, which reduces to £22.50 an hour when they leave the office to drive from their office to a court which is not within their own town. If they're going to a court within their own town, they don't pay anything for travel. The advocacy rate is now £59 an hour. That just does not compare with the levels of charge that can be made on a private basis. Many firms like mine uh, support the legal aid side of our practice because of the fact that we can charge properly, I would say, on a legal aid basis. Now, there's no, on a private basis, now, there's no way that we're going to get parity or anything like that. We accept that. Uh, the certainty of payment was always the reason why there was a discount in the legal aid sphere, and indeed, indeed to a degree, a, a, a public service element. But the message has got through now to young solicitors and to those who would be solicitors that there is no money in criminal defence, and so they simply do not want to do it. My daughter recently started a traineeship, not a may say, in a legal aid firm. She knows of no one, either in her LLB year or in her diploma year, who was going into criminal defence. There were some going into the Crown. And, of course, the much-needed and well-received extra investment in the Crown has only further harmed the position of the defence bar, because with that funding, uh, there has been a further uh, departure of young defence solicitors from the defence bar into the Crown. So when the government is funding more sheriffs, more prosecutors, the question from the defence side is, where are the defenders going to come from? Uh, because we're just not seeing people keen to join. And frankly, my fear is, although I have a, 
a plea for extra funding, please. My fear is that it may yet be too late because the demographics are just not there. And I think Mr Green made that point to the Cabinet Secretary last year. It's old folk like me and Tony who are doing this job. Tony sees it now from the sidelines. I'm seeing it perhaps more remotely. And it's also worse than that because we're seeing firms who are simply saying we don't want to do criminal legal aid anymore and they want to do something else, whether that involves pulling in their horns. So when there are the calls for extra funding, I would urge you please to take them very, very seriously indeed, because we have to make sure that all parts of the system are funded to, to pull together. And our part is presently chronically underfunded, and that's seen across the board. Thank you very much. Um, I want to follow on. I probably uh, maybe best address to um, Tony Lenihan and perhaps Eric McQueen uh, whether you have any concerns about the extension um, to time bars um, to account for the COVID period. Um, I, I have put on record my concerns about that. I appreciate that in the crisis that was necessary. Uh, but it has meant significant um, delays in trials, while people on the remand figures in Scotland have been commented on internationally as being unacceptably high. And of course, um, Kate Wallace um, from Victim Support Scotland, I'm sure, would point out that that has an added effect um, for victims. Um, so I just wondered if you, if you had any concerns or not about further extension to the time delay. Uh, first of all, Tony Lenehan. Well, uh, I'm not sure that I could see how Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service could have done a better job in this, because I, I think it is fair to say that Scotland led the way in solving the crisis of how you continue to have jury trials and social distancing and all of the problems that COVID brought. So I think that this is an inescapable evil of this particular crisis. I, I can't think of a way in the real world of improving on the situation that we currently have and with the bold plan to roll out 20 high courts running each day um it's that i think is to be applauded rather than be criticized because that's a that's a bold that's a bold so undertaking the faculty of advocates and it will stress every aspect yeah sorry so, sorry, I just wanted to be clear. So, um, I'd like to put on record. I appreciate that up until this point, that's necessary. But going forward, the extensions may still exist, and we may be putting that into permanent legislation um, to allow that. So, the faculty of advocates don't have any concerns about the remand figures or the impact on witnesses. Then, if there is to be a further extension of these time limits, you don't have concerns. No, no. What I'm saying is that the position we're in just now has a backlog. What is happening just now is that great steps are being taken to diminish the, back, the backlog. And so th that is already in place and moving forward. That will be the, the secret to reducing the backlog. Now, the backlog means that people have to wait longer for trials, whether they be accused people or otherwise. And sometimes people have a record of offending or the allegation in its whole circumstances such that it is thought better that they remain in custody. So it's difficult to see how I, you know, I, I can't propose a situation in which you just stop remanding people in custody where the, the overall circumstances suggest that they should not be um, at liberty during this time. Courts aren't approaching it that way. So people who are remanded in custody and it has been decided both when they first appear before a sheriff and then subsequently when they appear in the High Court that they need to remain in custody. Those cases are going to take longer and they're going to be in custody for longer. So it's not a case that I am happy with that situation, but that's just the reality of the situation because we're doing things, Scottish Court Service are doing things as quickly as reasonably could be done. Let's say, for example, they said, well, why don't we roll it out to 40 High Court trials a day? You don't have anything like the staff and the personnel necessary to, to have that in place. It just simply wouldn't be possible. So within the realms of what is possible, it seems to me that moving up to 20 trials a day, which is pretty close to double what we were doing before, represents the best way forward. And the best way forward will result in trials as soon as they can reasonably be brought. And the truth is, you can't do any better than that. I, I would wish it was, I would like so many things in life, 
I would wish we were closer to perfection. But the reality is, I think the situation just now, in the practicable sense, is being handled well by Scottish courts and tribunal service, and it will be reacted to by members of my profession, members of the solicitor advocates' profession, and the Crown, and we'll just simply cope with it. Thank you. But it simply won't be possible, for example, to say, well, let's just have all the trials within the time limits, because we don't have the courtrooms, we don't have the staff, we don't have anything. We lost months and months and months of trials last year, and then trials were slower for a bit as we built back up. All of those time delays are, they have taken place, and it cannot be fixed, at, uh, which is simply with the wave, waving of a magic wand. I think Scottish courts and tribunal service are doing the best they can, and I recognise that. And so I'm not criticising them for that. You know that there will be, I imagine, tens of thousands of people who are waiting a lot longer for important surgery and the likes as well. Every aspect of life in Scotland, as far as I can tell, has been impacted adversely by this. And all I can say is that Scottish courts and tribunal service seem to me to be trying very hard and boldly to fix that. And there will be consequences. There's been consequences for all of us. And I wish there hadn't been, but I can only fix or acknowledge the fixing of things which are realistic. Thank you. Can I just come in, um, Ms McNeil? I think, Mr Dealing, would you like to make a comment to follow up on that? Um, I, I would, if you don't mind, because it's following up on Ms McNeil's concern last week that, of the scandal of remand, because this is something that perhaps I can give the committee some reassurance on. Because although it is a responsibility that again falls largely on the defence solicitor, the question of remand and bail is a dynamic process. Because just as the Crown can apply to have someone, uh, someone's grant of bail reconsidered, so too the defence, and far more so over the period of COVID, can go back to the court in different scenarios and a change of circumstances to say simply that a remand is no longer proportionate. There is authority from the Lord President in relation to a case that decided early on in the lockdown in relation to the tests that should be applied. And whilst, yes, it is unfortunate if people are in custody longer than they would otherwise have been required to be, there will come a stage where that remand may no longer be proportionate. And in particular, where we are looking again at things like electronically monitored movement restriction condition bail, which we looked at some time ago and rejected. Uh, then the question of reducing the remand population and doing so proportionately to the circumstances of the case it becomes a, a, a reality. So it is not just a single decision to remand and then that period extends and extends and extends. It can be looked at and in appropriate circumstances a prisoner who was remanded can be released. Now, of course, that brings other tensions. Uh, I, I too would commend the work of Victim Support Scotland in, in, in relation to uh, their uh, side of things. I am conscious, however, that this is a new committee, and I was conscious of the use of the word victim in last week's session and the use of the word victim today. I do not want to make your job any more complicated, but can I make this observation that pre-conviction, victim can be a very difficult word to use. I know that Mr Finlay has been the victim of crime. I have been the victim of crime. Other members of this committee and the participants are likely to have been the victims of crime. But we have a presumption of innocence, which requires the Crown to prove both that an offence occurred and that there has been an offender who committed that offence. And I would commend to the committee the report of Sir Richard Enriquez in relation to the failings of Operation Midland. It principally, and the starting point of that report is institutional presumptions which tag on to the idea of victim. So I am making that point, if you don't mind, at this stage, just to ask you to be careful as you embark on some very difficult work. But please be reassured in relation to remand that, generally speaking, subject to the question of statutory reconsideration of the test of substantial risk, it is a dynamic process. And as remand terms increase, it is not merely a question of throwing away the key, as it were. And for that response, eh, Mr. Darling, and if uh, you've uh, followed my lines of questioning through the period, you'll know that I've always been clear that I'm interested in fairness to the accused, which is why I was interested in this question about the role of the defence. Eh, convener, I have a few other questions on prisons and police, but I mean, given the time, I'll, I'll wait to see if there's time at the end, if that's helpful. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ms McNeill. I'll just now hand over to Ms Mackay and then I'll bring in Ms Clark after that. Thank you, Convener. Um, good morning, everyone. I'd like to ask um, Kate Wallace, please, if she could comment um, about the effect of the backlog um, on victims of domestic abuse. Um, I've had constituents contact me, um, obviously extremely stressed about the situation. Um, this is a crime that victims you know, have to live every day, so it's probably you know, quite unique in that sense. Um, can you maybe comment on your thoughts? Could you give me your thoughts on it and any way that you, any preferred route that you would like to go down to try and address it? Thank you, Ms. Mackay. Um, am I on? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, so, I mean, obviously, what we saw during the pandemic was an increase in reports around domestic abuse and a, and a real um, plea from victims for support who were trapped in the home, um, often with the perpetrator, which was a really distressing situation. Um, obviously, what we're also seeing, um, as I pointed out earlier on, was the, 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 the delays and the backlog. Um, having a huge um, compounding impact on people in terms of their mental health um, as well. Now, you know, I know the comments have been made around trying to reduce the backlog. There's there's questions around capacity and resource issues around that, and 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 I'm well aware and supportive of everything that SCTS is, and others have been um, doing to reduce that backlog. However, what I would say is that that, that for um, for what. And not using the legal term victim, but using it in the term that that's what um, people prefer to be called. Um, they very much do not like the term complainer. Um, if asked, so in the spirit, Mr. Darling, of um, why I'm using that um, that terminology, it's not meant as a legal phrase. But the delay um, in the backlog um, means for victims who are expected to give evidence, they have to hold that in their mind um, all the time. So they. They're really preparing themselves to give evidence. They're, they're exceptionally nervous um, and worried about um, the legal proceedings, particularly around going to court, particularly around potentially um, having to come face to face with the accused again. Um, and there are some measures that we can put in place around that. But from a victim's perspective, it's a hugely distressing um, time. Many people say that they feel they can't move on from it because they've got to keep it uppermost in their mind. They don't want to forget anything um, that's crucial. So they've got all of that going on. And then the other thing I wanted to say about the backlog is that is one problem and the delay is a problem, but so is some of the issues that um, Tony Lenahan talked about earlier on, which is the uncertainty, adjournments, um, trial dates moving. Um, you know, a real, you, you think you're going to court, you think you're giving your evidence or you think you're giving it remotely, and then the rug gets pulled out from under you and the trial's not going ahead that day. That has a hugely um, negative impact on, on victims and witnesses um, too, and, and, and really has a, a further impact on their mental health. So, from my point of view, um, what I would be asking for is, um, as well as the continuing um, measures around increasing capacity, but is to couple that with planning across the systems because it is not working efficiently at the moment. We know that the adjournment levels are huge. Um, as I say, Tony Lane has talked earlier on about um, accused persons and others who are using COVID symptoms as, as a way of delaying and delaying um, trials, and, and certainly we've seen that too. So, uh, you know, I, I want to see real focused effort on, and, and Mr. McQueen and I have, have had several discussions about this in terms of making the system more efficient, working together, planning together, so that we can reduce both the delay but also the uncertainty um, for victims and witnesses. Thank you. Thanks. That's very helpful. Um, I just wanted to add that last session we did um, pass le groundbreaking legislation for domestic abuse protection orders, which are not enacted yet, as, as far as I understand. But um, you know that 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 will be of comfort. Um, in the future to, to some. Could I, could I ask um, Theresa Medhurst, please, um, it relates back to a question my colleague um, Colette Stevenson was asking about um, contact with families in prison. Um, and I was going to ask um, if there are plans to keep um, the current methods that have been used during COVID and also to ask families outside, the organisation Families Outside have suggested that possible um, virtual contact could be made for um, 
a parent, say for instance, at parent um, teachers' nights and, and, and things that they, they should be involved with, with their child. Is there any scope, are, are you planning to sort of widen the scope of, of the, the virtual contact for families? Good morning, Ms Mackay, and thank you very much for your, your question. I think you've raised a really valid point that there is potential to broaden out the um, range of opportunities to have the parent involved with the child, particularly where the child wishes that to be the case. Um, and we are actively pursuing that. So thank you very much for your question. Thank you. That's that's really encouraging to hear. Thanks very much. And one final quick question, please, if I may, to Tom Fox. Um, good morning, Tom. I wonder if I could ask you about the women's, the new women's estate that's been built and if COVID has affected or delayed the, the construction or implementation of that. Um, if you could comment on that, please. Good morning, yes. Good morning. Um, yes, unfortunately, we've had some construction delays, as I would imagine some of the committee may be well aware. But we're still on target for the three new facilities, the one at Cornt on the site of Cornton Vale, or part of the site of Cornton Vale, and the uh, community custody units in Glasgow and Dundee, coming on stream next year. Uh, by hopefully by the beginning of the summer. It's an exciting opportunity, as I'm sure you know, and we, I had the opportunity to discuss with this with you at the Cross Party Working Group last year. Um, the facilities are well advanced, and I'm sure we would welcome uh, the committee coming to have a look to see the work that's in progress and to see the range of facilities that are going to be in place for what we believe will be a really groundbreaking and game changer for uh, helping empower women in custody back into constructive and positive roles in the community. So I'm sure we'd welcome the committee if they felt that they would like to visit uh, to come and see for themselves what's what's in trade. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's helpful. Thanks, Convener. Thank you very much, Ms. Mackay. Um, Ms. Clark, would you like to um, ask your questions, and then I'll bring in um, Mr. McGregor, who is. Um, joining us online. Final um, members' questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if I could pick up on some of the points that were raised earlier in relation to the emergency COVID um, re regulations, um, because in the programme for government yesterday, it was clear that we should expect legislation, both in custody, custody and bail, but also legislation to make um, some of the emergency COVID practices um, permanent. Um, and Polly McNeill has already um, specifically raised the issue of time limits. Um, and we've heard very powerfully about the experience of witnesses, but also um, that there's been a success with the electronic use of documents and um, taking more evidence on commission. And the suggestion is that that should be extended and perhaps have um, witness evidence um, by um, uh, remote means. Um, we obviously have a, an adversarial system in Scotland rather than an inquisitorial system. Whether that's right or wrong, that is the system we have. And I wondered, um, in terms of the detail um, of what would be acceptable, in your opinion, and what wouldn't be acceptable, um, to what extent do you think these kinds of methods, particularly um, the hybrid model, um, should be by agreement of both parties? Um, or, or, or what do you think the, the detail of the legislation that you think this place would you know, be able to pass and that would seem to you to be reasonable? Um, what would that look like? Could you maybe give us a bit more detail on that? Because I think this is going to be quite a big issue going forward. And, and perhaps if I could ask um, maybe uh, Tony Lenehan and, and Ken, um, to come, Ken Darling to come in on that, really the detail of, of what you feel would work. Um, thank you. I would say, so beyond my submissions, the submissions deal with two positive suggestions, one in relation to electronic signatures. It seems as if that won't meet any opposition uh, the question of remote balloting of jurors, I, I think, also is the same, but that's not a huge step in itself. Uh, I do salute the value of increasing the, the scope for commission evidence, so capturing the evidence early on from vulnerable people. That seems to me to have taken a step 
forwards during the lockdown. There's very much a, an emphasis on that. Out, out with it used to just be for children, but it's now broader than that. Uh, whether that requires any further legislation or not, I'm not sure. I think just simply increasing the estate within the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service to allow more of that. Um, the question raised earlier on about uh, by Eric McQueen about moving police and expert witnesses remote in, in giving their evidence. There is a working group in relation to that, which I am presently on, and I think the view is that where witnesses are identified as being suitable for that, then let us move forward with that. But it should not be the case that we move towards all police witnesses giving evidence remotely, because very often police witnesses have evidence which is a critical focus of dispute, and that needs them in the courtroom, I think. So, our membership, I think, is content if we move towards removing people from the courtroom where both parties, or more than both, if it's if it's a multiple accused case, are content that that witness doesn't need to be in the courtroom. So, then convenience does favour having them removed and does favour having them uh, remote and virtual. I think beyond that, you know. The, 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 I do not want to raise the subject of Lady Dorian's report, because I know that we have only got a few minutes left. But within that, I had a very constructive meeting, along with the Vice Dean of Faculty, with Sandy Brindley of Rape Crisis, to identify common ground. And it might be that we can join heads and put forward some sort of proposals to you, where there is common ground between the defence bar generally and Rape Crisis, to improve the experience of all who are involved in courts, but also the efficiency of that. So. I, I probably I, I would be content if you would welcome some sort of submission from uh, um, ourselves and Rape Crisis to identify what we think is common ground coming out of Lady Dorian's report. You know there are still big issues. The notion of juryless trials for serious crimes is a is an emotive subject, and I am entrenched, I am afraid, in my opposition to that. Uh, but I, I think the things that I've identified in my submissions at the moment would be the things that are, are straightforward and should be brought in. Uh, and, um, Ken might assist. Uh, yeah, and, and Ken Darling, would, would you agree with that, that it, it should be by agreement, where there's agreement, so there'll be some police witnesses where actually the evidence is relatively uncontroversial and it could be agreed, but other um, key witnesses, whereas Tony said that the evidence is critical, it's controversial, and would it be right for that evidence to be taken um, remotely, where the accused and their representatives didn't agree, with, or, or do you feel there would need to be agreement to that for the right to I, I'm fair cautious, trial? I, I'm, I'm cautious the extent to which I agree with Tony Lennon, or you'll just not invite me back, you'll just have him. Um, but the position is that some procedural matters can be dealt with remotely very, very efficiently. They don't need to engage the accused. Sometimes you have to engage the accused that you can't get anywhere. You can't make any progress. The comment was made by Eric in relation to virtual custodies. I'm a relative convert to virtual custodies. Uh, virtual custodies are being piloted in Falkirk for the Stirling Falkirk and Alloa areas. They're about to be rolled out with other testing courts within Tayside Central and Fife. And the plan ultimately, as I understand it, is to use virtual custodies otherwise. They seem to, funnily enough, be well received by the accused. Who are appearing, they're not having to be bussed around. That kind of thing works as long as the solicitor can engage appropriately with the client, can engage with the prosecutor, can engage with the court. Then I actually see no real difficulty for that. Subject to the need on the odd occasion to press the red button and say no, this person has to come to court, possibly to be seen by a community psychiatric nurse or possibly for some other communication uh, issue. A summary trial, a criminal summary trial. No matter that it is perhaps in the current environment been waiting to call for perhaps a year or 18 months, can be over within an hour and an hour and a half. It can be a very efficient way of disposing and allowing a, a decision maker, a sheriff usually, to get to the bottom of a criminal allegation. The minute you start to make that remote, the minute you start to involve technology, you have a control environment which can break down at so many turns. And basically, you're you're using a central body to try and control lots of individuals. And as we've heard, and as we realise, it's a people process. It only takes one part of that to go wrong. So I think you have to be careful that just because you have the technology, you shouldn't necessarily use it. There is a summary trial project to be uh, decided upon, to be uh, 
assessed in relation to Aberdeen not been favourably received, I have to say, by the Aberdeen Bar. No doubt they'll make their observations known. They may, like I have been, be a convert to the use of that type of technology. I very much doubt it. I think, lastly, to answer your question in, in particular, Ms Clark, yes, agreement is far better to proceed by agreement rather than to impose. There is always the possibility that someone will be unreasonable in their opposition, uh, and in such circumstances, decisions have to be made. But, as you said last week, there were very good reasons for doing the things we used to do them, and a lot of it we did incredibly well, uh, especially by comparison with our very near neighbour south of the border. Okay, that's helpful. I've got one final question um, to the Fire and, and Rescue Service. Um, there was a doubling of fire fatalities last year, and um, Ms. Sorry. Clark, I, I'm, I, uh, if there's not like time, to, to it's not a problem at yeah. all. I can raise it another time. That up, Thank you very um, much. If you don't mind, um, apologies for that. C can I just ask, um, just to follow up from from your questions, Ms. Clark? Um, Mr Lenehan, you, you mentioned some uh, contact that you've had with Rape Crisis Scotland. That sounded very interesting. and I, I think on behalf of the committee, we would be very interested to hear uh, a little bit more about that, uh, perhaps down, down the line, uh, as, as that contact um, progresses, if, if that would be possible. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is that you? Yeah, Thank yeah, you very yes, much. Of course. Of course. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just bring in, conscious of time, uh, our final uh, uh, committee member, uh, Mr McGregor. Would you uh, like to pick up your questions? I know you're uh, linking with us online. Yeah, thank, thanks, convener. I'm not sure if I'm on yet. Um, I, sorry, I think I am. Um, yeah, I would, I would like to direct my questions um, around the criminal justice social work area. Uh, and to, to James, maybe, and I know you've been waiting patiently, James, uh, to, to come in. Um, but I just want to say before that, um, firstly, thanks to all the, the, the other witnesses as well. And I think there's been a lot of uh, ground covered um, in, in the other areas. And I know that I think I believe that we might have lost the representatives from the fire service uh, online. But I did want to make a very quick comment, um, as opposed to a question, just to say thank you for the work that they've done. Um, <clears throat> locally, in, in terms of a, a very um, local issue relating to my constituency, the Coatbridge Fire Station, where they responded to a terrible blaze at a nearby restaurant, um, a Wheaties restaurant. It was um, very big news here locally, and um, the service that they provided uh, was second to none, just like all our emergency services. So I would just like to have that um, on the record since they've been here today. Um, uh, moving on to my questions uh, for James, maybe I probably should declare a. Um, an interest to refer members to my register of interest as a, um, a criminal justice, a registered uh, social worker with the, the SSSC. But James, I'm wondering if uh, my first question is very general. If you could outline um, the impact of the pandemic and the recovery period, if you like, um, on criminal justice social work services um, in the round, what sort of impact um, has the pandemic had on your services? Thank you, Mr McGregor, and I welcome the opportunity to provide evidence to committee on behalf of Social Work Scotland. The um, initial impact of the pandemic um, was, was profound um, because we went into lockdown and a number of services had to stop. For example, the delivery of physical unpaid work uh, had to stop at, at immediate effect. Um, we had to um, cease delivering group work programmes in terms of interventions around the Caledonian system, for example, domestic abuse, uh, moving forward, making changes, um, sex offender programme. So that clearly had a, had a real impact on the work that we do with individuals um, on community orders and on prison licences. Staff were working from home, therefore contact with individuals was either by telephone or, or by using some form of video um, capability, capacity, Things like WhatsApp, for example, um, and moving into that sort of online um, territory, um, and it has been commented upon. In terms of the the virtual world, I think that's here to stay. Um, it will be part of our business in the future, but we do need to get back to that face-to-face -face contact. So, as we move through the various stages of of COVID and the pandemic, um, we were able to resume aspects of the work we do, such as unpaid work. But whereas before, where advisor would take out the five individuals that was reduced because of physical distancing rules and all the other restrictions 
um, and the similar impacts on bringing uh, people back into the work into the workplace to deliver interventions programs to actually meet face to face with intervent uh, with individuals um but one of the key challenges for us is, is what comes next and what, what's about to happen um because we are now below zero um but local authorities are very much moving at different speeds in terms of their um removal of physical distancing for example some some are still being very cautious and retaining two meters distancing that has an impact on how we do our work in offices, in unpaid work. But the key challenge is what's coming through the courts. Um, we are working on the uh, assumption that we will face something like a 30-35% increase in our normal business. So to put that into some sort of uh, context and figures, we would get something like 16 to 17,000 community paper quarters per year before the pandemic. Now, if you add 30, 35% onto that, that's a significant in, in increase in business over and above the normal business that we would expect to get through the courts. So that is going to be hugely challenging um, because we're not yet the other side of the pandemic um, and court business will start to ramp up. They address their backlog um, this month and over the coming months. So just as social work are putting a lot of time and effort into planning for that, um, that's around recruiting staff, using the money that we received through the COVID consequentials. Uh, it was 12.8 million uh, across Scotland for local authority justice social work, and further 2.5 million to direct specifically for third sector services. Um, but there are challenges there. Um, we know there's a very limited pool of justice social workers out there who have all the relevant skills and qualifications um, to do the job. Um, so we're often recruiting people who need to get that training. That will take time. And some areas are reporting difficulties in recruiting. They're simply not getting people applying um, because there is that very limited pool to draw upon. Um, and there's a lot of competition between local authorities uh, to, to draw on that, that very limited pool. So there are significant challenges. I think uh, just the social work is, is, is rising to those challenges. We are being imaginative and creative. For example, by using online methods to deliver modules around um, mental health, for example, or employability skills. A lot of really creative work in going on with the third sector, the Wise Group, Street Cones, for example. Um, and as I say, I think the that mix of, of blended working between staff continuing to work from home and in the office is going to continue long beyond the pandemic. And I think there is a role for that ongoing use of the virtual world to have contact with, with the people that we work with. But we can't get away from the fact that many people need to be seen face to face, pick up those nuances uh, to understand and work with those individuals, many of whom have significant vulnerabilities, uh, trauma in, in their life. Um, so we can't move away from that. And that, that's been highlighted by other contributions this morning. Um, th thanks very much for that, uh, James. Um, I, I think it's, that was a very um, re robust response. I wanted to pick up on one bit, um, one area that you, you mentioned, though, and that was about, I think you said, we need to get back to the face-to-face -face work. I wonder if you can expand on that a bit, because uh, in your answer, and also my own, my own understanding, is that um, there is um, a level of work across uh, social work, and specifically criminal justice social work here, where face-to-face -face work has continued. Um, so I'm wondering if you're able to expand on, on where face-to-face -face work hasn't happened, um, what areas that, that, that would be, and, um, and you know, how, how you think that might be resolved moving forward? I think it's fair to say that throughout the pandemic, criminal justice social work have continued to provide the range of services that, that we do. Um, but the face-to-face -face contact uh, dropped dramatically um, because of lockdown and then moving through the various um, levels of the Scottish Government's route map through the crisis. Um, so the focus was very much on the high risk individuals, those individuals who present risk of harm, where there's imminence around that risk um, and the impact that would have on, on communities and uh, ensuring that we do what we can to, to help prevent victims being further traumatised or, or, or in terms of reoffending. Um, but we can't get the numbers of people back into offices um, even as we speak this morning. So whereas if you have an office of 12 people with 12 social workers, each seeing individuals on a daily basis, 
you've still only got maybe four or five or six people in that office. Therefore, there is real pressure on interview space. Some of that interview space is not really fit for, for use in terms of the COVID sort of issues, in terms of ventilation, for example. So there's still that impact on delivering group work. Um, and whilst we have moved to deliver individual um, one to one sessions with, with people, that's very resource in intensive. If you're running groups for up to eight people and then you're having to do that on a one to one to one basis, then it's, it's, it's kind of obvious that the impact on resources. So all these things are, are having a real tangible impact. Um, and, and colleagues are working really hard to to, um, to get back to where we were, but that's going to take some time. Uh, and there is an impact on the workforce as well. Um, that's mixed. Some areas would, would say their their staff have retained a resilience and, 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 and good morale. Others are reporting staff are really tired um, because of the way they've had to work during the pandemic. Um, and I'm sure that that's just, that's the case across all the, the organisations represented on, on the call uh, this morning. Um, and these things will take time to work through. Um, absolutely, they will. Thanks very much for that uh, again, James. And I think it was uh, useful for you to put um, to put on the record there that you know, in terms of high risk situations and, and individuals, that um, that that uh, service has continued right through the pandemic, like um, the, the other uh, emergency services as well have spoke about today. Um, my final question, um, if that's okay, convener, um, is in relation actually to the announcement in the programme for government yesterday. Where um, you, you'll probably be aware, James, that the the um, the First Minister announced a, a new a plan for a new national community justice strategy, um, and that is to invest in community justice services, a diversion from prosecution and promoting alternatives to prison. I, I mean, I, I suppose what I would ask you in relation to this is what would be your expectations about that? Because obviously there is going to be now a year of um, you know, discussions around it. What would be your expectations to come out of that, and how do you think that can um, any any solutions that come through that, or any plans to help um, your services uh, recover from the pandemic? I think my hope would be that, and, and this is reflected in the programme for government yesterday. You know that, that real commitment to making that shift from from prison to community. I think we have to invest in community justice in its broad sense, including justice, social work. Um, there's a commitment in the programme for government for 500 million over the next, uh, you know, several years to invest in the prison estate. We need to see similar investment in the community. You know, by by comparison, just the social work is is funded to the tune of just over 100 million per year. Um, so we do need to invest, I think, in community services, community justice services, including just the social work, if we really want to. Provide that um, that really high kind of high quality range of range of service delivery. We need to do other things that there are commitments to fill in some of the gaps. For example, to ensure that every local authority uh, is able to deliver the you know a domestic abuse perpetrator program with the Caledonian system, uh, and I welcome the commitment to roll that out. Um, we are redesigning other programs, such as moving forward, making changes. But we, we need to look at uh, what else is out there in terms of interventions. We need to identify what is best practice, what is effective practice, um, and seek to, to implement those consistently across Scotland, across Justice Social Work Services. So I think there are, there are huge opportunities. Uh, I think we have to be bold and imaginative. And there are lots of good things that were going on before the pandemic, and we shouldn't forget that. Um, for example, the Aberdeen City um, Care Inspector report on community payback orders, which more or less finished before the pandemic struck and was published in February this year, spoke about the transformative uh, impacts of the work that Justice Social Work is doing in Aberdeen and, and the delivery of interventions. So there is some really good practice out there. We need to build on that, um, but we need to look at other things that we can do, such as you know, the range of interventions um, that I've referred to. Thank you very much for that, James. Uh, that's me, convener. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. McGregor, and also um, my thanks uh, to Mr. Maybe um, for those responses. 
Um, I, I'd like to thank all our witnesses this morning. It's been a long but, I think, very productive session. Um, and I would invite witnesses, if you uh, feel that there are outstanding points that you would like to share with the committee, I'd very much invite you to, um, to submit those to the committee in, in writing, uh, and we will take that evidence into account. Uh, similarly, for, for members, I'm aware that there are some outstanding points that you would have liked to have raised, uh, and we'll um, certainly afford members the opportunity to do that uh, in due course. So, again, my thanks to our, our witnesses. And that now concludes the public part of this meeting. Uh, our next meeting will be on Wednesday, the 15th of September, when we will be holding two further roundtable uh, evidence sessions on prisons uh, and uh, youth offending. Uh, we will now move into a private session for the final items on our agenda. Thank you.